Good evening, every, everyone. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Did you use the excuse that you had to come to council so no one's got flowers or candy? Um, happy Valentine's Day. We, you're welcome. We will start this meeting by um, the, starting with the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by the invocation. I'll stand. I pledge allegiance to the the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you would uh, please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for where you have placed me and us at this time. Where we live is no accident. Where civility is a part of our culture. Teach us to be patient, kind, and understanding. This neighborhood is my mission field, and I declare these streets are where neighbor will embrace neighbor. The strong will stand for the weak, the young will respect the old, the capable will assist the unable. Our homes will be safe havens of friendship, kindness, and compassion. No one will go hungry, no one will go unnoticed. Lives here will be changed in the name of God Almighty. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Councilman Hamilton. We have adoption of the agenda. Mr. Cease. No changes. There are no changes. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? No motion. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? We also had minutes. We had a regular meeting, and then we had... Um, joint meeting, which I thought was wonderful with the Planning Commission um, this past month. So let's look at the January 10th meeting minutes first. Y'all have a chance to look at them. Are there any edits or changes? If not, is there a motion to approve? Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Finally, we have the special joint workshop meeting, which was January 17th. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say of saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. We have a section in our agenda on presentations, and it's our students a month. Yay! Come forward. Okay, first we have um, a monthly presentation we do to our student of the month while I'm coming <coughs> down, and y'all can come up. Um, Gracie Bowling? Is it Bowling? Um, we are a, one of the clusters in Beaufort County, and we are the largest cluster of students in Beaufort County. You come right here. Um, in Beaufort County, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. You might not know. Every school in Bluffton submits a student a month. Multiple, multiple. And they all get bundled together, and you got picked from that. So that's quite an accomplishment. So you're character was compassion. And you're a senior at May River High. Are you excited? Oh, stay in school. Don't ever graduate. <laughs> Parents don't like to hear that. So where your are you a teacher? You have anyone? This is in school. You're the good one. Do you want to talk about, because you're going to get in the picture too, so you may as well come around. <laughs> so tell us about Grace. Is it Grace or Gracie? Gracie. Gracie. Why did she get this on So Gracie is a senior at May River, and she was part of our teacher cadet program last semester. Um, and Gracie has aspirations to be an EMT upon graduation. And so she wanted to work in our special, severe special needs classroom. And when I, I don't have the words to express how much of a help she was in that classroom, how wonderful she was with all of our students. She showed not just compassion, but also grace um, with the students and the staff in that room. And both the teacher and myself were two of the people who nominated her for student of the month. So we are extremely proud of her. Um, and I just can't wait to see where life takes you. Absolutely. We all follow you now because we know who you are. <laughs> so, um, where do you, what do you want to do after graduation? So right now I'm at base for the EMT Perfect. program. And once I graduate, I'm going to go to paramedic school. Wonderful. Well, I think everyone up here would write you a letter of reference. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get her in there, people. This is our future. So you got to come with us. And 
We did a picture on the street, Gracie. <laughs> and your parents are standing here just smiling. <laughs> this is very rare. It's a challenge coin. And these are very collectible now. I've seen a lot of kids collect these at golf tournaments and big events. Uh, that's from us. Not many people get those. Come, picture. Yeah, I got them. And Tia can send it to you. Okay, okay. perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stephen, our town manager, will do employee recognition. Thank you, sir. Mayor and Council, we have quite a few in the hallway to introduce and recognize for promotions. Um, this is something we're always excited about. We try to do it a couple times a year just to make sure that we get all new employees in front of you so you can see their face and get to know them as you see them out in the community or see them work them in town. So first I'm going to introduce, I introduced to most everybody except for Ms. Frazier, but um, Elisa Richardson, she's our new emergency management director. She is recently from the uh, U.S. Coast Guard. She also graduated from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy. She's in emergency management with the U.S. Coast Guard, so we're excited to bring her on. She's been here for three weeks, yeah. give or take. So um, get to know her, because if anything goes wrong, this is who you're going to see a lot of during whenever we're shut up in uh, the police department. So but Lisa is our new emergency manager, so we're excited to have her. Welcome. Uh, next, I think most of y'all know, but that's our new police chief, <laughs> which is Chief Matthews. Again, he's been on the job for, is it six weeks yet? Just right around, just around six weeks. So, uh, Joe comes, uh, from, been with the Bluff the Police Department before that, uh, after that, most recently he was with uh, Pulte, but um, he is, uh, has a Master's in Criminal Justice and uh, Public Administration and BS from Ashford University. So uh, we're excited to have him on board. Um, you've probably seen him around. He's out introducing himself. So I'm excited to have Chief, and he'll do an introduction of his new officers in just a minute. The last one I have is Tracy Stormer, which I'll had an opportunity to meet, but we have not done introduction since she's been here. She's been here since, I think, November, October. September? October. 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 Six months is coming up. I, I got it on my calendar. It's coming up in a few weeks. So uh, Tracy came to us from your County Sheriff's Office. She had been in the Jasper County School District. Um, she has a uh, uh, BS from uh, Bennett College, and she also has a Master's in Computer Science from Atlanta University. We're excited to have her on board. She's doing great. Um, and like I said, it, everybody looked at her like, why are you introduced? She hasn't been here that long, but it feels like she's been here a long time. So we're excited to have her as uh, one of our uh, department heads. So, thank you. And then sure. up. Brian, you're doing the introduction of Diego. Okay. My pleasure to introduce you to Diego Farias. Diego comes to us from Chile. He, he worked for um, City of Valparaiso as a GIS analyst. He's been with us for a couple weeks now. Um, came very highly recommended by his peers, and he has a degree from the Universidad de Playa Ancha. <laughs> We're very excited. Madam Mayor and Council, I am very pleased to present our VP of Innovation for the John Ryan Center for Innovation, Mr. Paul Marvin Tides. Uh, he came with us uh, in October from upstate New York where he was the regional manager of the Small Business Development Corporation inside an incubator at a college. So, and he's also started his own business a number of years ago, so he's been there, done that. He's been a tremendous help to the Don Ryan Center and me. Um, he's already recruited multiple companies, and I know I can turn in, if I have to run out for something, um, he can take whatever I need and get it done. I don't have to worry about him at all. He's been fantastic hire for the town. All right, council. So in finance, we have with us Shannon Green. She's our new payroll and revenue coordinator. And she comes to us from Landworks Group in Ridgeland. Um, she attended Pasadena City College. And she has experience in uh, local government in California before coming back out this way. And she is actually in the process of doing payroll as we speak. So we're going to go back and finish that up. Thank you. 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 Thank you
Thank you. Hello, Mary. I am introducing to you our newly employed as of October, Shavar Seabrooks. He has a bachelor's degree in communications, and he comes with a lot of customer service. He'll be our court assistant for us. Table one. Yes, table one. <laughs> <laughs> and the next uh, introduction I have at, at Africa Aiken. She has been here for 16 years, but she was newly promoted to our lead deputy clerk. So I'm so proud of her for that promotion. Department. We have Angela Douglas, who was recently promoted in September to our HR generalist, and we are so happy to have her on board. Right. All right. Also, we have to you uh, to present to you today Hannah Hartberger, who was promoted to accounts payable coordinator on September 22nd. And Sharon White, we have promoted to Treasury Coordinator on October 6th. And next up within the Watershed Management Division, we have Mr. Stephen Seas, who thankfully goes by Joe Seas. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, wait. no more Stephen. Stephen Seas. Thankfully, it is Seas. So, yeah, thankfully he does go by Joe. He is a new stormwater inspector reporting to Andrea Moreno in the Watershed Management Division as a stormwater inspector and comes to us with extreme experience from best management practices, inspections with his State Management Services. That's a great name. And that's a great name. Definitely. And then next, it's been two weeks, three weeks, about three. We have Ms. Nicole Wright, also in the Watershed Management Division, reporting to you, Andrea Moreno, as a stormwater tech, coming to us from Gwinnett, Gwinnett County Department of Water Resources, where she uh, was putting to work her certificate in sustainability with geology and political science minors and a BS in environmental science from Georgia College State and State University. So now, thank you and welcome, Nicole. that we've had as well with the departure of one of our staff members, Sam, Ms. Sam Crotty, was promoted to Stormwater Permit Administrator on October 6th of 22. Thank you, Sam. <laughs> I told him you would have never smiled. As soon as you came in, sharp. I, I, <laughs> I have to um, Antonio Robinson come with us with 10 years experience. He's been here now a little over a year. He came up from us with Sea Pines. So he's been here for a little over a year and didn't have a chance to introduce himself to you guys. So he's here tonight. And I have Tony. <laughs> Tony Martinez, he has been in the landscape for over 20 years. He comes from us from greenery, um, with a wealth of experience um, and knowledge, and Tony's been a great addition for us. Great. Thank you. Always look short. Good evening, Council. Um, we have a promotion. Uh, Mary Sue McIntyre uh, was promoted from our part-time um, receptionist to a full-time customer service representative, and you've been with us for how long now? Six months. Wow. <laughs> very good. Yes. So, very good. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, we have several introductions as well as promotions. I'd like to start off with Joseph Oriski. Uh, he is a crossing guard. He reports to Sergeant Carafa. An interesting fact about him is he's, he is a firefighter uh, with the city of Philadelphia before coming down here. Thank you. Bob. 
Next up is Elizabeth Opdyke uh, reporting to Sergeant Carafa. She is also a crossing guard and she is previously from Somerville. Great. Now, so, uh, we also have a Richard Ramirez, who is a law enforcement officer. He is not here tonight. He is currently up at the academy. Um, he has four weeks left, and then he'll be on the road with us. And where did he graduate from? He graduated from Bluffton High School. Local guy. He, he coached by Lieutenant DeStazio and LaGrosse. So he is very, very familiar with the area, and we're certainly pleased to have him. Uh, now, some promotions. Uh, first up, Lisa Woodruff, she's been promoted to senior crossing guard uh, on October 10th, 2022. And Lisa, how long have you been here? Eight years. Yeah. Eight years as crossing guard. Uh, next up, Lieutenant Michelle. Oh, Mayors, that's right. <laughs> Uh, Michelle's been promoted to the rank of police lieutenant. She works for the uh, patrol division, and she was promoted on September 26th of 2022. Yay. Mayors, not mayor. Mayors. Yes. <laughs> Next up is Angela Serrano. She was promoted to police officer two on November 28th, 2022, and she currently works for our investigative division. Next is Kyle Herrick. He was promoted to the rank of sergeant. He is on the patrol team, and he was promoted November 28th of 2022. And last but not least, Elizabeth Gallo. Uh, she was promoted to the rank of corporal on November 28th, 2022, and she also works for the patrol division. Thank you, Chief. That's that it? Gosh. Wow. Now, if you want to repeat that, it's nice to see our staff getting full and really wonderful to see so many different faces. Thank you so much. Next, we have Blakely, which I did not hear she is. Uh, Blakely works for Dominion, um, and she is going to give us a tree trimming update for those of you um, who see this occur. You're here to listen to see what they do and what we can't do. So, Blakely, good evening. You are up. Mayor, members of council, thank you so much for having us today. Today we're going to be talking tonight about safeguarding our electric utility lines, why we do it, how we do it, when we do it, and hopefully we'll be able to address any of the questions that you have, as well as addressing any of the questions that those folks at home, your residents and citizens might have as well. Everything we do at Dominion Energy is about providing and delivering clean, reliable, and affordable energy. That's the baseline of what we do. That's why we exist, to make sure that we can provide clean, reliable, and affordable energy. So today we're going to talk about why do we do vegetation management. Well, first of all, it's critical to resiliency and reliability. It allows for faster storm restoration. It increases safety for citizens, the public, and our employees. And it follows national standards and best practices. Um, yeah, I'm going to show you a quick video um, about how this will take place and why. Maybe. What? I may be sending you all a link so that you have this information, and I'll share it with their public information officer as well, because it's got a lot of information about um, how and why we trim these trees. Um, oh, here we go. Let's see if we can make this happen. Trees are an integral part of the landscape across the communities we serve. Dominion Energy's obligation and commitment to providing safe and reliable service is our top priority. Routine safeguarding of overhead lines on a five-year cycle is critical to helping ensure a safe, resilient, and reliable electric system. Trees that have grown too close to overhead lines are both a safety hazard and the leading cause for power outages on our system, especially during storms. 
Dominion Energy, our proactive vegetation management program is key to keeping the lights on for all the customers we serve. Our crews work year-round to safeguard our employees, the general public, and our lines against hazardous and overgrown trees, brush, and other forms of vegetation. They adhere to nationally recognized, arborist-approved standards. Trees that exceed a maximum height of approximately 15 feet are not suitable for planting under distribution rights of way or near overhead lines. Mandated height requirements are more restrictive near higher voltage lines. We continue to collaborate with municipalities and property owners to ensure the right species of tree is planted in the right place to avoid utility trimming or removal as the trees mature. For more information on how you can help plant the right tree in the right place, visit dominionenergy.com slash safety. We wanted to let you all know that there's an interactive trimming map that's available that we will be um, that is available anytime on dominionenergy.com. We're also going to be working with your public information and communications team to make sure that your residents are known where we are, what streets we'll be trimming on as we go forward. Customers where, that are going to be impacted by trimming have already been notified. They were notified in the way that they received their Dominion Energy bill. So if they receive it by email, it would come in the form of an email. If they receive a paper bill, it would have been mailed to, the, to them directly. Um, and then this is part of the town coordination that we do. We continue to have annual planning meetings with your staff, uh, regular communications, ongoing site visits and inspections with the town and your team here. I have our forester with us this evening, Jacob Stanley, and he's going to walk through the how about tree trimming and upcoming vegetation management. Jacob? Mayor Soko, Council, how are you all this evening? So this is an illustration of our spec, which we'll get into a little bit more in detail later in this presentation. So this project is for 2023. Um, Southeastern Limb will be the contractor for this project. They're a local company. Um, they're a good company. They do good work. Uh, the work began on February 6, 2023. And as we talked about previously, we have already sent out all these notifications to these customers by the way that they received their bill. And Brandon Cheek is our area manager for Southeastern. He's here with us tonight. Are you going to show us where the cutting is taking place before? Yes, ma'am. There's maps in here. And just the arrows. Oh, I'm seeing them right here. Distribution line clearing specifications, which was shown in that illustration. So there's a minimum of 10 foot clearance to the side from the outermost primary conductor, um, a minimum of 20 foot clearance above the highest primary conductor. Um, and then there will be a minimum of 10 foot clearance below the bottommost primary conductor or four foot below our neutral. Service lines are cleared for abrasion when needed. Those lines are coated, so we don't trim those out as often as we trim out our primary. And if they have something rubbing on them, then we'll come through and inspect that and take that out. Certain conditions exist that do preclude these clearances, such as a significant size parent leader. Um, large trunks are located less than 10 foot from the outermost primary conductor. So what that means is anything like, say we have a really big parent limb that we just simply cannot take off. Yes, it may be close to our primary, but it's all, you know, we don't want to take it off because it might hurt the tree. We're not going to take it off. Um, any big trees that are within that 10 foot, we're not going to take those out because it's not feasible. There's no sense in that. So all of our trimming standards follow the ANZ A300, which is an American, American national standard for tree care operations. Um, the, this standard is supported by the International Society of Arboriculture. Um, it is adopted by the American National Standards Institute. It's arborist approved utility trimming standards. All of our foresters are also certified arborists and oversee and advise the contractors on proper ANSI cuts. So these are our just some illustrations of proper techniques. And basically what this does, you don't want to go in there and if you have a big limb that's coming out towards the tree, you don't want to take that whole limb off and just leave a stub there or new growth off. You don't want to just take that off, 
and leave a scar out there, you want to make a proper ANZ cut, and that's what these illustrations are showing you the best way to do these cuts. This is what can happen if we do not trim. Um, that is a primary line that has got into that tree, and you can see it actually caused some burning and some scarring to the tree. <coughs> <laughs> so this is our project map and this is one section of this project and it will take place from Buck Island Road just out just right on the edge of right by Parker's and it will go all the way over to Pritchardville um, we have some areas that go into Pine Bluff that are overhead on the back roads that we'll be trimming, but it'll be everything along May River Road, all the taps coming off in that area. What is, we gotta go back to that. What is the road between Buckwalter and 170? So it's that, that is, Gibbet, that is Gibbet Road. Okay, okay. And that's great out. We actually won't even be trimming that because it's, if you see, it's great out there, which means it's actually part of a transmission project. And then this is the other area that we'll be trimming. It's all part of the same project. This is where we started. And this will be coming out of our substation um, at the corner of Bruin Road. And we'll be going down Alljoy Road, Ulmer Road, towards Pine Island, Myrtle Island, all those areas. <coughs> Thank you. Do you all have any questions? <laughs> I have yeah. a question. Oh, <laughs> The uh, one thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is spraying. Yes, sir. Um, I brought this up last year, I, and I used to do what you do. Um, but when you're in an urban or suburban areas, especially like in a commercial area like our historic district and places near here, it, it leaves an eyesore. And so for the life of me, I don't know why you have to do that. I know that you're on the five-year cutting cycle. I know why we spray but I think when you get into certain locations, I mean, out in the rural areas, it's, it's predominantly, that's just the way the game goes as far as the trimming and the spraying take place. They go hand in hand. I do not think it's required or necessary in certain locations in urban, suburban areas. It creates problems for us, not only aesthetically, but from the public. So I would like y'all to reconsider that. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, I'll, I'll do that. There are a lot of questions. Okay. So, my question is, what protocols do you all have in place to remove trees and um, debris left after you do tree trimming? Because I know a lot of residents had complaints about um, items left in their yards and not being able to remove them. Okay, so what we do, we have a tree crew, which might be a bucket crew or a mechanical trimmer, which in this urban setting like this, it will be a bucket crew. And behind those bucket crews are what we call chip crews. They follow behind these bucket trucks, and they have a chipper and basically a dump bed. And all they do is they come behind them each and every day, and they pick that debris up, they ship it into the back of the truck, and they take it to a dump site, wherever that dump site may be, whether it's at their office or, say, a customer possibly really wants some chips or something like that, they would take it to that customer. And that is how they handle that. And there's not supposed to be any debris left overnight. So we will make sure that's taken care of. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I just have one. Um, my biggest, I know you got to cut the trees to keep everybody cool and warm. What I don't understand sometimes is the chemical use of the, whatever you want to call it, weed killer, uh, Roundup or whatever name it is, used in some areas that are really close to the edge of the bridge and our estuaries and our marshes. Um, we've seen this happen. Other places in the county have had like major problems with it on the Beaufort side. So what do you do? What can we do to prevent the, whatever you want to call it, I call it poison, from going in the, into our estuaries? So those contractors, they have all the proper permits from the government and EPA, whoever they need these permits from. and. They have mixes that are suitable for those locations, but I understand what you're saying about you're concerned about the runoff and that sort of thing. And these treatments are generally spot treatments. They go here with backpack sprayers, and they are treating just that brush that they are spraying. 
But I do see what you're saying about the runoff. Thank you. Your trimming that you demonstrated here in your illustration looks perfect. Looks like a perfect world, but that's not the way it ends up for a lot of our communities. Um, we get a lot of calls based on tree head. There's, there's just a, a tree with no limbs on it. There's no means for that tree to survive or have any it's an eyesore to, to the resident. So when that happens, who, 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 who takes the blame? Who, who, uh, would that tree be replaced? If, if, if when we call you and you come out and, and investigate and see that it was done wrong, how do, how, do, how do we rectify that? So that goes into the planting of trees with that right away. Um, one of those things that we have, you know, we have to keep our lines safeguarded. We have to, and not only for our reliability, but the safety of the customers and our employees. But some things I have done in the past is if I go out there and look at that tree, that customer, and they're not happy with it, and I can clearly see that they're not happy with it, and it doesn't look good. It is an eyesore, and I understand that. Then I may be able to work with them and give them that approved planting list that we talked about. And I can also, if they are agreeable to it and they do possibly want that tree removed so this does not happen again, we would do remove that tree for them free of charge. You know, we take care of that. And then we give them that planting list and it is, you know, a customer would, can plant something that's approved on that list under that right away. But isn't it also another step you could take when you know you have to make that tree um, probably not presentable to talk to the, to the resident that that's there, that home, that homeowner? Yes, sir, and we, you know, with those customers, when they call in or anything, I do talk to those customers. No, I mean before, before the fact, because that'll save us from getting the calls. If you say, went to knock on the door and say, we had to, we had to really make this tree look, um, <coughs> uh, because of the safety, we have to cut the tree back drastically and it may not be to your best, um, I'll see what you're saying. And yeah. I'll, I'll um, take that under advisement and I'll talk to our contractor about it. Maybe that's something we can do to, to help with that, you know. Who is our, so where you're cutting now is really kind of outside our limits. Yes, ma'am. And I'm glad, and I want you to come back when it's inside because we've had physical on the street, get the public out to show what you're doing. And I agree with Fred. The picture's great. Um, but... I've seen trees on Pritchard Street, and I've seen trees on Buck Island Road, that there's an eight-foot stump, and that was it, and that doesn't make sense. So I want to know who we, who our staff talks to, um, and you can get that to Stephen. That's just, you know, the spraying on some of the roads. I just don't think there's as much care over all of Bluffton as it is in certain areas. So. I want to make sure, because we all ride and we're all around, and ask Mr. Steve to get the text from us. If we see it, um, and we'll get calls from Aldroy, too, even though it's not in the town limits. Um, who is our point person? So that's what we need to know. And then second, you say there's an arborist, but I will, I've been here a lot of years, and I've never seen an arborist 9 to 5 with these tree cutters. And I know southeastern tree, so I can call him directly. But I've been told they're here 10 minutes, and then they take 45 minutes to go to Beaufort, and the arborist really isn't on site. So we need to be a partner in this because it is going to come back to Bluffton again. And, you know, we have trees that look like the Miami U, and we're in South Carolina. Um, we really got a partner on this. I, I'm following Beaufort really carefully about how on you know, they could be touching that poor guy every day. So, um, Stephen needs to know, is it you? Yes, ma'am, I will be your point of contact with the company. Okay. And then Brandon is with these guys each and every day. He is also a certified arborist, so he's with them every day. But he's not going to be there every day in the while they're cutting. You're going to be there. Yes, ma'am. You'll be here 9 to 5 while they're cutting? During the day, yes, ma'am. If, if I say, you know, I don't want to go somewhere, but yeah, I mean, I... I stay in this, I live in Bluffton myself, so I, I know that there's a little higher standards here and expectations about, you know, the, the trees that we do have. And, you know, we do have a lot of 
trees that are, are considered considered specimen trees here, you know, all of our live oaks, you know, people don't want to see big pieces come off of those things and, and really butcher them up. So, um, you know, I, I will spend most all of my day when we're in these projects with those crews and, you know, just like today, I was, I was out there all day with them. So, um, when we get to those really sensitive areas, you know, I, I don't think people are going to be as, as, as apt to uh, criticize and put on a pine tree as they are, you know, these specimen oaks. You know, we got a lot of laurel oaks, red oaks, water oaks, and, and especially the live oaks. So um, we're going to spend our time and, and do it like they need to be done. Well, we'll just need to get both of y'all sent, though. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> thank you for coming. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have public comment. Public comment. Let me just give a little read that I do. Um, public count. First of all, council fully supports and encourages public comment. It's a privilege, however, it is not a right. Governing bodies are not required to have public comment. You might not know that. Um, but under our town ordinances, public comment is allowed, but we subject it to very reasonable rules, which are listed every single month on the TV screens. Uh, so you have three minutes. Um, please observe the following protocols. Address council. And in speaking, avoid disrespect to council and any other personalities in the room. Confine yourselves to the questions under the jurisdiction of this council and be mindful and respectful of those who are present. We are very strict on our three minutes, and I hate it, but we've got to be um, because this, the rest of the meeting is a business meeting, and we've got to do the business of the town. But we do want you to come forward and um, have your chance to speak to us. So I'll throw it over to our town clerk. Sharon Brown. Sharon Brown. Okay. And when you come up, please, as we might know you, say your name and your address. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I will not to begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. And that's Dr. Martin Luther King. And what matters to me is our youth. I want to do that, that for yeah, so everyone can hear you. to start right now. That's why I did <laughs> Thank you so much. Good evening, Town Council, everyone. Um, happy Valentine's Day to you lovely people. Uh, I want to thank you guys. My name is Sharon Brown. I'm at 163 Buck Island Road in Bluffton, South Carolina. And I am here to touch on a delicate subject that everybody, I'm quite sure, is aware from the Island Packet article. But I'm hearing about the MOA that we have with the Bluffton Eagles Community Action Committee. Because in the paper, it was quoted by the chairman that it was hard for them to get funding for to do any type of work for on that field, okay? And in your MOA, it says, the committee has expressed an interest in working with the town in an effort to enhance and add value to the historical significance, cultural value of the Eagle Field. The town council has identified and upgraded the Eagles Field as high priority. You guys thought it was a high priority when you signed this MOA in 2015. What happened to the priority? Because I can tell you one thing, from the decline from 2015 to right now, where our children have to go on with the committee that has this from 2015, 2000, for 12 years, something's broken. So I am publicly asking this town council and the Bluffton Eagles Community Action Committee to meet so we can figure out what's wrong with this MOA, because something's broken. If you guys have already said that this is what you can help them with, and we can't find funds, and we can't do this for them, and it also states, you guys re review and approve as appropriate all development plans for improvement, including future expansion. Well, for 12 years, where's the expansion? So this is what you guys said that you would help the, com the committee do. And we have yet to do that. It's dilapidated, it's falling down, and we have structures out there that are unsafe for these children. And I understand you're saying it's a private property, but you guys signed this in 2015 with the chairman right there, who's also a town councilman. So we got something broken here. So we, the community, would like for you guys to meet with us with this organization that refuses to communicate with people such as myself, who's very interested in helping. But with that said, we want to know what's going on with this MOA. And by the way, it says also that if they're not in uh, good standards, this would be voided. Well, in 2019, they were suspended. So somebody's not doing the annual report. You're not, you guys are not following up on this committee, this organization. 
Okay, so publicly, I just want to say I want to see that we have some kind of committee meeting so that the community can know, have transparency on what's going on with all the funding, and then you guys can help them come up with a plan to upgrade that field. It's disgusting. And I appreciate you guys, and my number one priority is always our youth. And for someone to put structures like that out there, for young people, something's broken for 12 years. We need something done. Okay, thank you all very much. I want to thank you and have a great Valentine's Day. Hey, look at that. I get the clock this time. <laughs> so I brought you guys something. <laughs> you can get the clerk. Okay, clerk, this is for Bridget. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. 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 Th
and the things that were listed that could go into this property. My feeling over the years, just to give you a little background, I was on Hilton Head for 30 something years and I'm here because I had to leave there for what went on. And I feel that the things that were listed, all those stores and apartments and things like that, they're really gonna create a lot of problems, for instance, in the school. If you have 200 apartments and 10% of them have children, that means that's one classroom. Well, one classroom for this apartment, one classroom for that apartment complex, we've got to build a school. And my feeling is over the years, and I got a lot of years behind me, uh, the developers get done, and the residents have to deal with all the problems down the line that come along. So I think if, this, to me, when I saw all the things they wanted to do, but we don't know which of those are gonna to come to fruition. So if we absorb that, now we're in a battle, oh, we wanna do this, we wanna do that, the setbacks and things of that sort. So I was surprised that they don't have to come up with some plan prior to the annexation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Ms. Gamer, that's it. Public comments closed. Um, we don't respond at public comment, it's just for, for you to speak, but we do have a section of our communication from your council and Judge also, because that's the time if there's a response they can make it. So we'll move on to communications from Mayor and Council. Anything? And, and if you're on a committee, if you want to give us an update at this point, this is when you want to do it. So anything? Uh, yeah, briefly, Mayor, I just wanted to commend our police chief and also our uh, town manager and town staff who worked with uh, Bluffton MLK to host a community conversation in light of the death of Tyree Nichols. It was a very eye-opening, insightful conversation and dialogue that the community was able to engage in, and we're certainly looking forward to host more conversations like that as we continue to be a, a leader in the community and having conversations and knowing that we can learn more from each other than uh, we can be disagreeable with each other. I'd also like to encourage everyone to um, attend any of the upcoming Gullah celebration events that are going on now throughout the month of February. And uh, at the end of the month on February 25th, there will be a celebration of African American Authors event at the Oscar Frazier Rotary Center, <clears throat> excuse me, and that features um, former uh, Penn State Hall of Fame NFL player Aaron Maben, who's now an internationally acclaimed artist as well as an author of several published books uh, who will be there in addition with other authors. And it's a free event, and we encourage everyone to come out for that. Starts at 11 o'clock. What date? February 25th. February 25th. Thank you. I'll just go down the line. Um, I'd just like to say happy Valentine's Day to all of you. I hope you can um, get out of here early enough to spend some time with your favorite ones. I uh, bought my five dozen roses earlier today for my three daughters, one 13-year-old granddaughter, and, of course, my wife. So I'm not going to talk too much. Nothing else? Anything? Larry. I, too, got my flowers. <laughs> Just wanted to say, follow up on what uh, Councilman Frazier was talking about. And I've said this before, everybody at this table has some communication or relationship with nonprofits in our community. I happen to be on one as well. And um, so you cannot have a good community if you do not have strong nonprofits. The city cannot do everything on its own. So what I am asking along the vein that she just mentioned I'm on the Bluffton Jasper Volunteers and Medicine Board, and our gala is May the 11th, Hewitt Oaks. Put that on your calendar and support any nonprofit that you're capable or wanting to su support because each and every one in this community is highly important for our quality of life. Thank you. Um, just two, well, lots of ribbon cuttings. <laughs> Bluffton has two Chick-fil-A's. I don't think Hilton <laughs> has one. So here's a win. Um, USCB opened their Chick-fil-A, and it was just a party. Um, Chick-fil-A.
chicken. It was great. Um, the Lutz C43 race was Saturday um, uh, a week ago, and I think it raised a good amount of money for scholarships for our kids that has to do with distracted driving. And talk about nonprofits, this F3 in the Low Country found two local, local, groundbreaking, smaller nonprofits, one on Hilton Head, one on Bluffton, to give uh, money to. And they saw 400 butts, Kevin. 420. 420 Boston butts. And it was, I bought two of them. I should have bought more. It was fabulous. So find out more about them. They, whatever they make, they give. And, and Kevin, thank you. That was great. Um, but one thing I want to say I want to put on our agenda for council to know, too. We were just at the Municipal Association, which is our town association all over the state. And they are seeing nationwide how uncivil people are. And they are bringing about a civility, respect, and solutions. And so they asked all of us to put this pledge on our agenda and I just got to figure out where to put it. I think it probably should come after maybe invocation. But the pledge is that we pledge to build a stronger and more prosperous community by advocating for civil engagement, respecting others and their viewpoints. <laughs> We sing. You can answer it. Face is red. Check your phones. Okay. Um, for civil engagement, respecting others and their viewpoints, and finding solutions for the betterment of my city and my town. So I think it speaks to a lot of what was said today at public comment. Um, and I want to put that on there because I think we all need to believe in that when we come in. And you, you can get things done without being mean and hateful and saying things that absolutely are true, um, which does, did not happen tonight, but it does happen. So um, I want to get that up. So we'll get that on our agenda. So that's it. Formal items. Let's get going so we can all see our others for Valentine's Day. First, we have our audit. Um, Chris yeah. Forster. You got the guy who's looking at us. <laughs> You're so, okay. the yeah. <laughs> so uh, before you is the, this binder. This is your annual comprehensive financial report, commonly known as the ACFR. Uh, this is uh, the, the report that was put together by staff um, and audited by our auditors, Molden and Jenkins. So first I'd like to thank our staff, Cindy Colby, who put a lot of work and hours into putting this together. So thank you, Cindy. And now I'll turn it over to Trey Scott. He's already played his intro song. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Your face turned really red. <laughs> I, that's never happened before. I'm a little embarrassed. So again, my name's Trey Scott. I'm with Malden and Jenkins. I was the partner who oversaw the audit of the town's June 30, 2022 financial statements. And pleased to be here with you all this evening to discuss the results of that audit. Just kind of give you an idea of why I'm here today. I'm going to introduce Malden and Jenkins to you really briefly, go over our auditor's report, uh, our compliance reports, talk a little bit about the financial statements, and then go over some required communications, and then certainly answer any questions that you all may have. Really quickly about Malden and Jenkins, we've been around for a little over 100 years. Uh, we serve approximately, well, a little over 650 governmental entities throughout the southeast. Uh, we do this across 13 offices in five states, and the uh, office that serves the town, uh, which happens to be the closest in proximity, is, is our city of or our, not our city of Savannah, but our Savannah, Georgia office. But enough about Malden and Jenkins, I think of particular importance to you all, uh, is our auditor's report on your financial statements. I think, as you all know, as Chris mentioned, I think you have the big, thick, annual comprehensive financial report or act for in front of you. Uh, and, and those are the responsibility, or that is the responsibility of the town. It's our responsibility as your auditor to express opinions on that financial information based on our audit. We do that by following government auditing standards and, and generally accepted auditing standards. Uh, and I'm pleased to be here or pleased to tell you all this evening that uh, we were able to issue the, the town a clean or what we call an unmodified opinion. Uh, and that's what you're looking for. It's the highest level of assurance that we can provide to you as your, as your external auditor. Also included in that act for are a couple of compliance reports. The first one we call our yellow book report. If we had any issues, material weaknesses, significant deficiencies, uh, instances of non-compliance, it would be reported to you in that report. We had none of those. We had no audit findings. So you had a clean opinion, no audit findings, and I think that's just a testament to the 
hard work that, that Chris, his team, Cindy, the finance department do on a daily basis and, and certainly something they should be commended for. Additionally, you all spent more than $750,000 in federal expenditures this year, uh, which required you all to have a single audit on your major federal grant program. Uh, we, we did that audit, also had no issues that related to that, so no findings there as well. So uh, certainly easy to get up here and give, uh, give good information versus bad. Uh, moving on, your ACFR, uh, in case you didn't know, goes above and beyond the annual reporting requirements of the local government. You present a little bit, uh, a little bit more, a little additional information uh, in an introductory section and a statistical section, uh, which goes above and beyond the basic financial statements that, that you're required to report. That's submitted annually to GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, uh, in their certificate program. You all have received that certificate 14 years in a row. Uh, it's been the 2022 actor has been submitted and we don't uh, anticipate there being any issues with you all getting that for a 15th time. So uh, again, certainly a, a great thing as well as it relates to, to your financial reporting. Now, if we take a look at the numbers themselves, you all have two sets of financial statements within that ACFR. You've got government-wide financial statements, which take a look at the, at the town uh, in a more global view, big picture view, all of your funds rolled up together. And again, these are just numbers on a page, uh, but to point out a, a few key items there, those bottom two bullet points, that's a good healthy net position. Now that doesn't mean you got 65 million of cash sitting there that you need to spend. That's just the difference between your assets and your liabilities. Uh, uh, but we also had a nice increase to that net position in our, at the government-wide level as well. And that's what we're talking about there in that second bullet point. But I think what you, well, let me back up. Uh, what we like to see when we see those nice, that nice growth is, is reinvesting in the town. And that's what this graph shows. I mean, we can look at numbers all day, but I like pictures more than anything. And we can see a continual growth and reinvestment in the town's infrastructure and your capital assets. That blue bar is your depreciable assets, the green is your accumulated depreciation. And what I see there as well is we've got a good healthy mix of new assets as well. If that green bar were closer in height to the blue, it would tell us that our assets are getting old. We're not really truly reinvesting in our system. So that's certainly a good healthy looking graph from a capital asset perspective or an infrastructure type perspective. What you all are more, I guess, or what you see more on a monthly basis are your fund level financial statements and specifically your general fund. Uh, and I have to tell you, this is a really healthy looking general fund. Uh, again, I'm not gonna read these to you, but those bottom two, uh, one of the more common questions I get is how healthy are we? Uh, and, and while an audit's not designed to tell you that, uh, you can look in certain places for, for general um, uh, indicators that will, will give you an indication of, of, of how healthy you are. And eight months of expenditures in an unassigned fund balance at June 30 is, is a good strong place to be. And then the liquid ratio. So how many times can we pay our current liabilities, our accounts payable, our, our payroll? How many times could we have paid those um, as of June 30, 2022, with the assets or current assets we had on hand, you could have done that 4.7 times. So that's a good, strong, liquid position as well, uh, and, and certainly good to see. Another graph really quickly, kind of looking at this, uh, your revenues, your expenditures. Uh, with a town that's growing like Bluffton, I would expect to see revenues growing over the course of those five years. Same thing with expenditures. That's what your blue and green columns are and constant growth in our, in our fund balance as well, which is what that gray column is. So that's a good uh, looking trending um, um, graph there over the course of the last five years. And moving on to the things that governmental uh, auditing standards require me to communicate to you all again, clean opinion, no audit findings. We also had no management letter comments. Anytime we find maybe a process or a procedure that needs to be improved or we think could be improved, we issue what's called a management letter. We had no such management that are comments for the town this year. No difficulties in dealing with management, no disagreements with management, no uncorrected misstatements, and then also want to make sure you all are aware that we're independent of the town in accordance with all of the <coughs> applicable standards of our profession. And that pretty much concludes what I want to report to you all today. Again, it's certainly a pleasure to serve the town and, and we look forward to serving you in the future and hopefully next year when I come I won't uh, play anything on my phone in the middle of uh, disability discussion. So. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, any thoughts or comments or questions? Just for acceptance, we don't vote on this. I have two. Okay. Um, so on the liquidity, um, the four to seven ratio, and on the monthly uh, 
period of months was eight. So is there an industry standard of what we should strive for? Well, you all are a property tax driven revenue government, right? You rely on property taxes to fund the services that you provide. So with being a June 30 year end, you're not collecting any more property taxes or significantly collecting any more property taxes until pretty much December, right? So you, GFOA says dependent upon your year end, six months-ish is a good place to be, especially for a June 30 year end. You all have eight. That's a, that's a strong, healthy fund balance. So st standard-wise, around six months based, based on your year end. So we don't need to be up to like 10 or anything like that? Well, you know, we also have to consider where we are geographically in the United States, too, and, and contingencies. And nobody expected a global pandemic in 2020 either. So six months, again, is a bench line, but that's, that's a determination that, that you all as governance would need to make. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? There is a motion. I'm sorry. We do have to accept this. Um, if no other questions, is there a motion to accept the fiscal year 2022 audit for the town of Bluffton presented by Malden and Jenkins LLC and its inclusion in the annual comprehensive financial report for the year ending June 30th, 2022? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Thank you. Thank you. Much. All in favor, say, saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. And I'm guessing this will be on the website. Right. Right. Um, Heather, item number two, consideration of a resolution calling on the South Carolina legislative delegation to amend the South Carolina Code of Laws governing approved uses of accommodations tax and hospitality taxes to include workforce housing as an approved use of such taxes. And to amend the South Carolina Code of Laws so as to increase South Carolina housing tax credits from 20,000 to 40,000 annually. And Hilton Head did this a month ago. Um, in while she's getting her presentation, we spoke to Tom Davis. He's already filed a bill on this, and we are looking at this to support his. Okay. <clears throat> I'll I'll in the face. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so yes, this is just basically reaffirming and uh, showing a united uh, effort with, like I said, similar resolution that Hilt had Town Council passed in October um, this past year. And really, it's just to express support for what's now been introduced by Senator Davis as um, General Bill S-284, which basically um, expands the use of tax dollars for affordable workforce housing efforts, as well as the, and also in addition, um, not necessarily this bill, but we're, we're asking for uh, support is to increase our housing tax credits from $20 million to $40 million. So um, does both of those things. And again, that's consistent with Hilton Head Island. Um, just want to uh, support that. Again, just expanding the use of funds for affordable housing. As you know, that's one of our strategic plan uh, focus areas. And so again, just uh, requesting that there's support for that bill. I misspoke. I didn't see the three. It is, I was wondering why we increased 20000 to 40000 Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. No, no problem. <laughs> Questions? Hey, are all the uh, jurisdictions supporting this? I'm not sure about all of the jurisdictions. I don't know as if we have discussed this at length at a Soloco meeting, but I do know that Hilton Head Island has specifically requested it, and Senator Davis has introduced um, and we know Senator Davis met with all of us, so I'm sure he's met with all of the other council members in his district. But we can we can bring it up at So Loco and and just tell them and bring the bring this and let them know. So and I believe I am sorry I did miss, misspoke. I believe they did ask for a copy of our resolution. Um, so Loco, for example, yes, I believe oh, so. Unless I'm getting mixed up with another one. Any other questions? We'll make sure they get it. anything? Great. No other, was that all, Ms. Wood? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the resolution calling on the South Carolina Legislative Delegation to amend the South Carolina Code of Laws governing approved uses of accommodations and hospitality taxes to include affordable and workforce housing as an approved use of such taxes and to amend the South Carolina Code of Laws as to increase South Carolina housing tax credits from $20 million to $40 million annually? So moved. Is there a second? Is there any discussion? Thank you for doing this, Heather. Um, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? That's unanimous. 
Next under formal agenda items is number three, consideration of the acceptance of University Investments LLC and Grandy Oaks two LLC's 100% annexation petition to annex certain real properties contiguous to the town of Lofton's corporate boundaries consisting of 86.36 acres, more or less, and bearing the tax number is written on your agenda. Kevin. Great. <coughs> Thank you, um, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Um, as you just stated, we're here for the 100% annexation crest for the 86 acres at the southwest corner of Buckwalter Parkway and Lake Point Drive. Uh, the University Investments in Grandy Oaks, two LLC are, are there. The applicant is in the audience here this evening. Um, Pursuant to the annexation manual, there is a concurrent uh, zoning map amendment. With this request, the applicant is looking to go into the Buckwalter Plan Unit Development. Um, associated with this would be amendments to both Buckwalter uh, PUD, the development agreement, and the concept plan. Uh, this was um, uh, previously in front of you as an intent to annex uh, back in October of 2020. As you remember, we were all on Zoom. Uh, there was quite a few difficulties of hearing everything, uh, so I'm glad we're in person to be able to do it this time. Uh, that initial request was for 13.399 acres. Uh, you asked the applicant to come back uh, with an expanded um, application request. They have since done that uh, to the 86 acres, which you see this evening. Um, the properties, the 86 acres is broken down into 35 upland, 51 wetlands, all in unincorporated Beaufort County. Uh, currently, the properties are vacant with a single uh, cellular tower, tower located on that. Uh, here's a vicinity map. You can see the area shaded in gray as the proposed annexation area. Again, you can see the cell tower there. Here's an aerial map um, it could better represent the area. I've highlighted uh, the Parker's gas station on the park on uh, Buckwalter Parkway, Buckwalter Place, and then One Hampton Lake Apartments. The properties that we're referring to are uh, dashed in yellow. And then from a boundary map standpoint, you can see that these areas, the area in green is the Buckwalter PUD, which is incorporated town limits. And then the areas in red are what they're proposing. So uh, what the map would look like in the future is these areas that are in red would turn to green, which would be that Buckwalter PUD designation. Uh, the Grandy Oaks, the property is currently part of the Grandy Oaks PUD. Um, and then these are some of the the uses that are listed um, as uh, uh, by right, so they could potentially do these uh, uses. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. Uh, this is a copy of the PUD master plan for Grand Oaks. I've highlighted the areas in red to represent the VC1 and then the BP um, uh, districts that they are currently located in. Uh, so again, the applicant is requesting that they are, their property is zoned that Buckwalter um, PUD designation. With that, they would have their own Grandy Oaks land use track. Uh, this is similar to the Buckwalter Common land use track. Um, as you guys remember, a couple of years ago when St. Gregory the Great came in, we gave them their own dedicated land use track. Um, so that way, this is very similar to this where they have a list of uses, and it was one of your attachments where they broke down all of the uses that they're being proposed, which is consistent with uh, what the current Grandy Oaks um, uh, uses that are allowed. There were a few that were, were down zoned, meaning that was less intense. And then there were a few that were, I'm not even going to say that they were up zoned, but it was just, there may have been a, a use that was listed that had a conditional use uh, associated with it. And then there would still be a conditional use associated with that as well. So very minimal changes in that zoning designation. Uh, the applicant is also requesting that they have 53 units, um, which is currently in the um, Grandy Oaks PUD. So again, we're, we're talking about uh, the concerns of upzoning properties. Uh, what they're trying to tell you is that they have the units in this uh, PUD in the county. They want to shift it over. So they're not necessarily increasing um, the number of units that would be physically on the ground. Uh, but it would be a, technically an increase because it is increasing the number into the PUD. So we're just moving, moving those numbers from here over to here. Uh, with that, they would be required to meet our um, workforce affordable housing condition of at least 20% um, being of that. And they are requesting that the 86 acres are uh, uh, zoned general commercial. Uh, this is a copy of the proposed concept plan. I've um, enhanced it to where you can see the hash marks. That's the area that the applicant is requesting. 
The area to the north of that is the Buckwalter Commons um, land use tract, which is in essence that general commercial or your high intensity uses. Also on the map, which was uh, difficult to read, I've kind of just increased this to where you can see that for their density summary, uh, this information has been included as well as the acreage. Go back to that one quick. I didn't see that in my packet. This is the map. It is, it is the text okay. right here that is very difficult to read. <laughs> uh, and I knew that you wouldn't be able to read it on this map, so what I did is I just blew it up so you could actually read it right here. Um, so these are all of our ver uh, various land use tracts uh, that we have out there, uh, and then what the acreage and unit count is. From a process standpoint, this evening we're here for the intent to annex. And again, all this does is that this is the application being presented to you. Uh, and you can either uh, choose to accept the application. And what that does is that starts the process. Um, uh, the next step would be going to the negotiating committee if you uh, deem that that's necessary. Uh, and there may be the need for additional ne negotiating committee meetings. So uh, again, from the process standpoint, Negotiating committee, then we go to our planning commission for a workshop, uh, then back to planning commission for a public hearing and recommendation, and then two readings to town council. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Before I look over, I did want, because I think the gentleman <coughs> spoke at public comment, asked why we didn't get more conceptuals and all of that. And I think we've tried that in the past, and it was a lot of work on staff when staff had no idea how council felt about even its in desire. So it, it's, we kind of flipped around to see if this worked. So that, I just wanted to make sure he got his question answered without answering during public comment. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I will look to the right. Any questions? Are you no, no questions, but I do have a comment on the issue. Um, so from a, a capacity standpoint, I'm just concerned in terms of considering the annexation where we are and currently the, the strain of our, our public services and um, issues that we're seeing now with traffic, among other things. And I think it would be advantageous for us to address those issues currently that we're faced with um, before looking or even considering something like that. So, Dan, do you want to come back later? I'll go ahead and say a little bit right now. Um, trying to find somebody that has contacted me in the last week or two or three that wants this to happen other than the owners. Um, the concerns, one major concern that I have, which it may be clear and it may not, is the conversion of commercial property to residential. Once it becomes a part of the Buckwalter PUD, there's somewhat of a given right, so we've learned um, to convert commercial property, and we've had lots of lots of developers doing that these days, and if there's one thing that we don't need, in my opinion, we don't need any more residential units in our schools, on our roads, in that area, um, just south of there. Old Miller Road, where it butts all the way up to Grandy Oaks. I got a lot of people that I know that live in there. They, I'm yet to meet one that wants any more. Um, and I'm, I, I'm, I've got a lot of questions, but I, I just really don't have a lot of support for it at this moment, unless somebody can show me something different. Do you want me to answer, answer that? Answer sure. Answer. So the, the conversion question is the Buckwalter PUD has had a, a conversion which was capped at a total of 500 residential units. That, that has already happened. So no more uh, conversion of commercial to residential is allowed um, under, under the current PUD. In that particular one. In the Buckwalter PUD, correct. Yes. Right. So this the applicant would not be able to convert uh, commercial acreage into residential units. And Kevin, if I may, the usage of the wetlands where it shows on here where we've got fifty two acres that are considered wetlands. Um, can they still be filled in for a fee? You know, there were a lot of places where 
We, I can't remember what we call that policy. Where is it? Delineation, I think. Delineation. So, as part of the Buck Walter PUD, wouldn't they be allowed to do that? It is, um, it, it is frowned upon from the town, um, and it's extremely difficult. That is a permit through the Army Corps of Engineers for, um, for the delineation, for being able to fill in wetlands. Uh, there's a lot of um, documentation that's behind that um, that goes a little bit out of my wheelhouse, um, but I do know that, um, that that does go through the Army Corps of Engineers. It's a very costly and it's a very time-consuming process. And, well, in your opinion, you're, you're the professional at this, not me. What advantage is there for the town to annex in 52 acres of wetlands? <laughs> um, I, I'll be honest. I don't. I don't have a, 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 a an opinion at this very moment. Thank I'm you. happy to look into it, though. Thank you. Over here, question. Of course, you know, I have to ask about affordable housing. It says that it would include 20% of workforce affordable housing at what AMI? Well, that would be a good one for the negotiating committee. Um, as of right now, um, we have listed as affordable at the 100%, uh, excuse me, at the workhouse is at, the workforce is at 100 and the affordable is at 60. <laughs> Um, I'll rest right then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. a few observations here. Um, I think the questions that have been asked, um, if we do not allow it to go to the negotiating committee, by right, they can do what they want to do that's already permitted with the, in the zoning with the county, or allowable by the county. In other words, they can build shopping centers, they can have various things, they can have some RDUs, whatever. And it is almost tit for tat. So if, if we didn't allow the annexation request to move forward, we have no say in the matter. If we let it go forward, then it will go to the negotiating committee as outlined by you, then the planning commission, and then two readings of town council. Then we have some say. And we can actually answer a lot of these questions that we will have no say in whatsoever, whether it's negotiating how many AMI levels, whether it's talking about HOA fees, whether it's talking about warehouses, uh, the comparison table, if we want to make that a certain table uh, it fits our needs like we did over there at the church site. Um, the conversion rights, as you already said, are off the table. So I personally would like to see it maybe move that direction because otherwise we have no voice. And the only other question I had was the, um, and, and by the way, if it goes that direction, it's a strenuous, more strenuous process than what they'll go through with Dufour County by far. Um, and that includes even the discussion of the wetlands. So um, the only other question I had is the innovation drive connection. Would that be a traffic light at some point? Or is what are the plans for that? The innovation drive is listed on the Bluffton Parkway access management plan <laughs> as a full signalization. Okay. And last comment, um, if the county drives this bus, there's no discussion at all about affordable housing. Correct. All right. Thank you. So a couple questions. Maybe I'll, um, I just wrote down a few things looking over this. Your, that picture with the red, um, Kevin? Yes, ma'am. The picture with the two red outline parcels that I'm showing She's you showing right you. here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Sorry, I guess it would help if I looked up. That, it's okay. I was going to ask where you looked up in a minute. <laughs> so, Question, um, and I've educated myself this over the years of being here. I've always bragged about how Bluffton had a 50-foot buffer, but I realized several years ago it's only if the ex existing land on the other side is in the county. So now if this gets annexed or we decide to move this forward, now that 50-foot buffer, um, this project would go to Z whatever because it's within, it'll be just like the landings in, May, in New Riverside. Right? So let me, if I could, and this might be a better representation of a map. 
Um, specifically dealing with, with the Hampton Lake property. So this property right here, I don't have a good representation, I but, have you on that. but I provided an, an email earlier. There's a 50 foot strip of land that is in between the homes on Fording Court and the Grandy Oaks property. So that, that is owned by the Hampton Lakes Homeowners Association. So that land stays in place. Um, now what could happen is if this property is incorporated into the Buckwalter, um, if this were to go to the negotiating committee, that's something that the negotiating committee could negotiate to provide an additional buffer along that side. Um, the, now, the, the, the 50 foot buffer continues along that, that dotted line right here. So, from a, a planning standpoint, by having the, the control over development of this area, while the buffer goes away between these two properties, then you could have actual contiguous development as opposed to having a a strip of land that is, you know, a hundred, anywhere between 80 and a hundred feet, uh, you know, along that line. So you'll have development and then th this weird strip of land of trees and then more development behind it. So I'm a fan of Wayne River, so I don't like seeing, I think with New Riverside Village, that wasn't, didn't go to the negotiating committee. And I think we at this point can give ideas, right, Terry, and fault yes. on what's presented. Um, and then we had residents at the landings upset and it was just an oversight. So I think we have so many things that a group of seven would discuss something's going to get missed. So that's not one thing. My other is how, how do you get access to parcel C and D? Because in the middle of A and F, you have B and E and I don't, you have the two red. What's who owns B and E? Uh, so this this map might help uh, represent. And is retreat. Okay. Yes. So how where's the access to that? So, so the, the the property along right here, uh, what you're referring to. I'm sorry, I'm going back and forth. So C and D mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. When I go back to the aerial, you can see that it is this property located right here. Mm -hmm. uh, access. This is this is general commercial property here. That's I believe is currently owned by by the applicant. So they would be able to provide access through, you can cut through a buffer to provide roads, so they could provide access there. Uh, in the future, along the access management plan, there is a proposed signalization at, at this point in the light, so access between the- I don't see a light there. I think you're talking about innovation. In, in the future, no ma'am. So in, here's, here's innovation right here, and then a future light would be located here. This is immediately across from the L apartments that is currently okay. under construction. So the entrance to the L apartments, again, is located here. So access would, would come through here. We have three red lights within a half a mile of each other and the county agrees to that? No, yes, ma'am, that's part of the access management plan. Okay, yeah. my other question, I have two other thoughts. The 86 acres of commercial, I just don't understand that when there's only 33 up, when Yes, and they're only going to be 50 some homes there and they can't convert commercial to residential so now where's the 86 acre is i'm just asking so, on that that makes sense to sure me. my understanding that's that is the that is the applicant's request as of right now okay. um if you were to move forward and to go to the negotiating committee that's something that would be negotiated that's something that staff uh, would bring forward and, and would deem that it's appropriate that Upland acres uh, would only be have development rights, and not uh, wetland acreage. And my final question: That to remind everyone that Parker's red light is temporary. Correct. And retreat never tried to get us to pay for a road that didn't even go through the town limits. There's no road to Innovation Drive. No one's forced the retreat to go there, and I don't see. I just don't. I spent 45 minutes today going five miles, and I think it was the wrong day to do it. And, and it was at a red light in a place like this, and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is crazy. Um, I, I, I just don't see it. I just think it's a lot to ask to even think if we want to consider annexing, yet we want it to go to the negotiating committee, and there's so much of an ask here. Where do you even start? And if you say no, we've wasted a lot of your time to go through this, 
when there's so much being asked for, when it's not even realistic, it could be put on this site. I'm just confused over that. Uh, so, so again, that intent to annex, that's where from a staff level, we're, we're just, we're, we're kind of laying out what their application yeah. is. We, we have not done that research, but if you decide to move forward and this goes to negotiating committee, absolutely. That's all the information we're gonna start putting together in, in detail. There, there's no point in us uh, expending our energy if, if you're just if you're not even wanting to, to move forward. Mayor, I have another thought. On to yeah, I, I, I'm not right. upset okay. with anything. It's just I think we're all here. And we, we're living it and we're breathing it and we're writing it. And then we see something that's asking for more than what the land could even. It just I feel like it's all coming. Let's we want all of this, and then we got a negotiating committee, and then. It's just such a vast difference between the want and what, what the negotiating committee could even begin with. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm done. Those are my questions. Yes, no, I was um, going to respond to Councilman Wood. I, I understand the, the need to control the narrative by putting it in the hands of the, of the negotiating committee, not leaving it just up to the county. Um, as stated, though, my concern is just that even before doing that, we have to address our issues um, before even considering annexation and to bring another area in and considering things of, you talked about going 45 minutes just on 46 at any given point now, that, you know, that's everyone's time limit when traveling that road. You know, we're down a certain amount of officers and I think to burden town services without being able to address or respond on how we're going to um, remediate any of that, I think would be negligible on our part, even though I understand that you're, you're wanting to consider being able to have that conversation of including affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> how many units would we get at the sacrifice of putting a, an extra burden or strain on the, the services and residents currently are um, being affected by the, the issues that we're seeing now. Well, they can do it anyway through the county. I mean, that's the whole point that I was making. Whether we, if we say no, they can go to the county and they can put stuff there. They don't have to have our input. The other part of this is we're not saying we're going to annex. We're saying let's let it go to the negotiating committee, a group of people, then the planning commission, another group of people, and then it gets two readings from the town council. That's a lot of eyeballs plus staff going through the whole process that they will not be held accountable to if they work with the county. So. I, I get what you're saying, what I'm saying though. <clears throat> Currently we're down, I think, what, eight or so officers. So if it goes to negotiating, that's still a problem that lies within us. And I'm just saying like, if we don't have the, the foresight, if we don't have certain things on our end buttoned up, I think even considering it, knowing that we're just gonna compile onto it because the purpose of going to negotiating is to come back to us to be able to make a decision on on yay or nay. And I'm saying even before we get there, there are certain things that we should address before considering that. But we can't do that tonight. Right. Right. We can't. Oh, yes. Yeah, we can't we can't get all those answers tonight. Um, but I'm only interested at this point <clears throat> because we have to have every tool in the box to bring affordable housing in. If it's five, is more than we have. <clears throat> and we have an opportunity to make, um, make this fill some of the, the void that we have in, 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 our, in our inventory right now. Every, every opportunity needs to be at least examined, unless we're gonna be here again another 20 years talking about affordable housing. But that would be affordable housing at 100% of our AMI. The people who currently are not able to access affordable housing wouldn't even benefit from that. It's not all true. It's 60 to 100, not all 100. And, and that's what we need to negotiate. We can say we want to spread it out evenly. And just... 20% and we want a certain percentage at 60, a certain percentage at 80, and a certain percentage at 100. But we have to negotiate to get that. Uh, no, 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 I just a question on the camera. I just want to remind council that, you know, for the last 10 years that I've been serving here, I don't know how many 
times, but it's been dozens. Things have become, come before us, and we've been approached by different um, residents and people, and it's like, why are y'all letting them do this? What do we say? It's because these development agreements were signed back in 2002 or five or six or before our time. We've all said it. We all know, when you look at almost every one of them, we all wish that they weren't so much density. You know, that's why our schools are overcrowded. That's why our roads are overcrowded. We got too many sardines in a one, in a, in a, in a sardine can. We got more than six pack in a six pack box. We know if we, I mean, I know if we were gonna do another development agreement, it would not be as lenient as the ones that we have right now. <coughs> um, going, allowing it to go into Buckwalter PUD would be doing the exact opposite of what all of us have said that we wanna do, and that is to slow, not allow more and more when we don't have to. If they can build in the county, God bless them. Well, I, I disagree with your statement. I mean, I, I again, if they can go to the county and do what they want, want to practically do that we're asking them to do. Why do you want to come into town, man? You have to, you, you ask the client. Ask the client. <laughs> let's, 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 maybe that is a good, because you usually say the applicant is in the room. Yes, they are, because I saw um, Lewis Hammond. It's business. Um, a question, let me, let me ask a question. The county, I know, reached out to you, Kevin when there was a possible purchase of some land and they were going to ask for a zone. Yes. And you responded in a way, you know, you were very eloquent on that. So I know y'all talk. Is what can the, what would the county, have you talked to your county counterpart on this? Because would they do 86 acres of commercial that have, to, I mean, I don't see how they do it. I have a feeling it's to be spread over the whole, commercial can be spread out through the Buckwalter. PUD. Right. just can't be converted to residential. Correct. So now I'm kind of answering my own question I had. Now I know why 86 acres, it's not going to go here. It might be more commercial on Bluffton Parkway and wherever other land is within that. Yes, so okay. part of your first question is no, I have not talked to the county specifically okay. about this item. Uh, and then the second part is yes, that it, unless there are provisions in place based through the negotiating committee, um, that that acreage could be um, allocated to other properties within the Buckwalter PUD. But I think listening to all of this is <clears throat> does the applicant really know what they're walking into? Because I think that would I think it would be a no starter for that with the the group I sit with. It would be more than twenty percent of affordable housing because I know what he's going to ask for, and it's not. And it can't be built last, like old Carolina. You know, I know people do it, and then it never gets built. I mean, we're just, I just think it's a bad time to discuss this. We have no idea on that red light. We have no idea on that road. And it's 800-plus retreat, which I think was another 150. So 950 homes use a temporary light. The county hasn't paved Old Miller Road. People would call him and yell at him because there's no red light on May River Road. It's just, you know, we're just at a bad time right now. Um, so that's just my thought. But do you want the applicant to, to speak so y'all can ask him a question? Take question before that. Yes. We, 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 we know what is on in the county right now, don't we? Yes, sir. So what, what are they allowed to do in that zoning? <coughs> These are the, the land uses that would be allowed. On the 35 acres. Yes, ma'am. How many acres does the housing take up? Just, just kind of rough. Um, a, For 55 houses, how many acres would that be? I'm sorry. You're making me do math. Four acres like per acre? Uh, seven, eight. Seven seven eight acres? Yeah, seven, eight, depending on how you're designing it. Okay. So did I understand, Kevin, from what with all this stuff I've been reading? Realistically, they can do the same thing in the county as they would be able to do if we annexed them into the town of Bluffton. Yes, sir. And that is what the, that's the guidance that we've been providing is that 
from, from you is that you're not looking for upzoning. So that's why the applicant came in with a land use that is very comparable. Um, they've, you know, there's a list of uses that were prohibitive. Um, so the intent was that they're coming in based off of that same level. They're not, they're not required, they're not necessarily asking for more intense uses. They're not asking for uh, additional um, units beyond what is what that county zoning allows. Uh, I think the, the concern that you guys have is that the 80 acre number versus uplands and wetlands, that's something that could easily be addressed um, if it were to go to the negotiating committee. Um, so, uh, so then again, that acreage is, is consistent. And it's also bordered by the county. Yes, sir. And as you know, again, you know, for the most, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, do you have questions for the applicant? I, I think that's a, that, that seems I to be the tripping point. Yeah. Who would like to speak? I don't know who's here. Hello, Mr. Hammond. How are you? Good to see all of you. I'm Lewis Hammond. I'm here um, at Applicants University Investments. I've also got uh, Nathan with Thomas and Hutton and uh, Jake Reed and John Solomon who are <laughs> with the applicant as well. Um, you have to speak up. Yeah, speak up. Close the back. Okay. Thank you. Is that doing okay? Um, the staff did a pretty good job of going over the background and what we're doing and what we're not doing. Uh, particularly things like we're not asking for anything we can't already do. Um, it's important to know. And also, they brought up the fact that we were here a little over two years ago and no action was taken. But one of the things said to us was because John Reed said he was looking at these other pieces. We were only looking at the top right hand corner of what you're looking at two years ago. And we were asked, if you're looking at the other ones, can you wait until you have those and come in once so that we're not coming in piecemeal, 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 um, which has been done. Another thing we were asked to do by council was when it came to the land use, our original original application was just going to put all of this into Buckwalter Commons. We we're going to put the whole thing into the general commercial, which is what's right beside within Buckwalter. We were asked to look at creating a special category and to look to what the Catholic Church had done. That's why we created this special category of Grandy Oaks Common. So whatever we put in this is only going to apply to that uh, Grandy Oaks Common and lets us tailor something. Um, we have an application in front of you. Uh, we would expect with the negotiating committee and council and planning commission after that uh, to talk about what's, but we have the, the mechanism there to negotiate for what goes into this because we're creating a new land use zone. Um, you don't have to worry about if you do something, will everybody else in Buckwater go? The people who will be before you will have the ability to do anything we agree upon. Um, Another thing that y'all have talked about um, is a concern over the 86 acre request for, you know, for commercial. That's really sort of, I understand the concern, but they just, we just put the whole number in there because the, some of the wetlands haven't been delineated. We're not exactly sure how much uplands, how much wetlands there's gonna be when the Corps signs off on delineations and stuff. We weren't trying to get extra commercial. We're just trying to make sure that what's there. Now, of course it won't be 86 acres, and of course we're not gonna be building in wetlands. Um, you know, that's one, another thing we'd be talking about with the negotiating committee, and we're ready to talk about that. Not to go to the wall for 86 acres, but to talk about how much leeway is reasonable until you get to final planning where these the, the exact uplands and wetlands are known. Um, and we're totally prepared to do that, have those conversations, we'll get past that. Um, as far as why would an applicant come in, why would we want to? Um, several reasons. I mean, um, I have been dealing with Bluffton since it was one square mile. Uh, John's been dealing with it almost as long. Uh, we've watched the staff grow, the council grow. Um, you're dealing with local people, local people that are really concerned about the land. 
we bring this in, it'll have to go through a master planning process. Questions like where are you going to put access and all, all that has to go through a master planning process, which is not by right. That will come to this council at the next level with more specificity. And things like uh, how much buffer goes where will be part of that master planning. It'll come to this council. We're not, we're not getting a vested right to do it any particular way there. Um, so those things will be open to negotiate. Um, another issue about why the town should do it, I, I would think the town would want to control it. The town has much stricter standards, and we know that. Um, I mean, John and I work with him. We've developed a lot in the county. Uh, Colton River, Belfair, Berkeley Hall, other things as well, probably. Um, in many ways, they're much more lenient than the town has ever been. But since we're already dealing with half of the, the holdings that are in the town, it makes sense to deal with one government, even if it's the stricter government. We don't have a problem with it. When it comes to why the wetlands, the town's going to do a better job of protecting the wetlands than Beaufort County. That doesn't bother us. Um, the town has adopted, as you know, stricter and stricter standards when it comes to stormwater and things. So even though we were vested under the overall PUD on some issues, it allowed for, for stormwater management to progress with the science, and the town has done that. So right now, your stormwater that would be applicable to this is much stricter than, uh, than it sometimes has been in the past, clearly more so than the county. Um, another thing to consider is this much stuff is going to go on the land. It, dealing with Bluffton for how it looks and how it works to us makes sense, and frankly, we thought it, it would make sense for y'all too. Uh, there's certain development fees, all the property taxes, is that y'all are driven by property, all that goes to the town, uh, or will come to the town, the still county will still get their piece, but it will all be town tax dollars uh, and town impact fee stuff. So all of those things help. Um, we just want a chance to continue the process, let the principal sit down with your negotiating committee, and everything that concerns you, we're going to talk about. And from what I'm hearing, we don't have much of a problem with everything we've heard today. It seems if you've answered the question. Did, he, did Mr. Hanna answer anyone's question? Or I got one more question for him. Okay. Covenant on affordable housing. Are you prepared to to have a thirty year covenant? What does it, what does your current ordinance say? Twenty five. Thirty. Thirty. Because we, we, we we're saying we will live with the town's requirements on the affordable housing. Okay. So that will be thirty. And I think for multifamily, y'all have a stricter standard as far as the income level for multifamily than you do for a single family home. And ask how much it was asked, well, at one time. Um, I'm, I'm just hitting that point. Maybe that was an urge, earlier version, but I know I talked to Richardson. And so, we were 60% for multifamily and 100 for single family, which didn't make any sense to me, but that's what I heard several years ago. affordable housing number percentages on multifamily? No, it's just it's sometimes when it's rental. I don't know if he's referring to when it's a rental number versus a for sale number. The numbers of what your rent is versus your mortgage turn out different, but it's still sixty percent. So, it, it, there are three things that can be done. It, it, there's a motion that passes for negotiating committee. There's a motion that says we're not ready to consider this annexation, or is it a motion to table? Um, we all have the same stormwater ordinance because the county, I got to support the county. We've worked really hard to partner with them and try to have a relationship. And I really feel with so low folks working. So we all have the same stormwater. I didn't realize that. Regional it. stormwater um, ordinance now, which is wonderful. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know what they would do. I mean, I really don't know what they do. I don't think they would grant 86 acres of commercial when you don't even have 86 acres of uplands. And I don't think you're going to get rid of all the wetlands. So you're dealing with 35 acres of uplands. I'm really trying to, I mean, listen, I hear you. I love the, the thought and the 
We're not even thinking about 86 acres. The local of this, but it's just, you've got no road to innovation drive. You've got a temporary red light. I remember Mr. Orlando actually saying he wanted this to come in as a bigger package, but I think he meant all of it, all the way to Bluffton Parkway, is kind of what I have a memory of. Um, you took out the gas station. I think that's why there was a no vote last time. But now there, that sits in a little donut hole of its own if, if we do this. And and I really care about what the county thinks. I really, we're trying, I can't, I don't want to bump the county right now because I think they're being equally respectful to us and it's taken a long time to get there. So um, that's my concern over it tonight is what's the county think? Can I just speak to that briefly? Mm -hmm. The county would be concerned as would the town if someone's annexing to give more rights. That's not happening here. And the, the county is recognizing Randy Oaks is being vested because it's a PUD which has been substantially developed. So. But, but they're asking so many. for 86 <laughs> acres. I, mean, I know you just drew a number and I know it's the kind of the old way to do things, but we're smarter today. And 86 acres of commercial and 35 acres of uplands is just. But, but we've said we, not all we want to build on is the uplands. We just don't know exactly what they're going to be. I know what to tell. Um, anyway, I, I just, I'm, I'm really on this. I hear Dan, but I totally understand. I just told someone last week, and I hear it all the time, uh, before I don't tell me you can't do anything about it, and we truly can work and do something about it, and we're in our midst of just, you know, it's kind of like bad timing. I mean, this is bad timing. Um, and I would totally, I have a lot of concern over the residents. Um, and, I, and I hear them, and I've been there, and I fought for arbors, for them to keep their trees, because that's why they bought here, because arbors equals pine trees. So I, I do listen to them, and um, anyway, I'm kind of just rattling. Yeah. Yes, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of council. Uh, happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> um, my name is Nathan Long. For those of you who don't know me, I've worked with Thomas and Hutton. Um, but one thing I did want to clear up that I think is getting somewhat lost was the whole reason that they were doing this. Obviously, they own the property to the north, but it was so that they can have a cohesive plan between the northern properties and the properties proposed for annexation, right? Because if we do it now, we're going to have to go with one set of plans and one set of rules to the town of Bluffton, and then we're going to have a road coming through to the to the pieces there and a different set of plans and a different set of rules in Beaufort County. So um, I think most of you know John Reed. Um, he's done a lot of things over the years. Um, but his vision, and, and again, we don't have master plans tonight, but was to create kind of a mixed-use development that flows together. Right, and with one set of rules like I talked about, even the number of parking spaces in a row or the size of tree islands, or you're right, the stormwater ordinance, that part's the same. We're, we are looking into that. Um, but I think that's the main message that I see getting somewhat lost in the discussions tonight was the, the whole reason to come to the town was for the cohesive plan. Uh, like we talked about, the uses are basically the same um, we actually created the new land use track to restrict some of the uses that, that the town that we heard last time that you didn't want in, from Buckwalter Commons, like the large industrial and some of the uses that were allowed. I think Jake has the exact chart on that. Um, the Back to the wetlands, I did want to clarify that as well. So you're right, with the core, there's a jurisdictional determination. It lasts for five years. That basically tells you the boundaries of your wetlands, right? That's not impacts, that's just where they are. So we have a JD on the eastern piece that you see up there on the screen. For the western piece, there's not a valid JD right now. Obviously, you need that. So that's jurisdictional determination. So, so that is just where are the wetlands? How many acres of upland versus wetland are there? Like in the application, the 35 acres that you see there was estimating from our environmental <laughs> consultant. They looked at the property and just giving you an idea of what the wetlands are. But I can tell you the core changes. The rules change as time goes on. So we, the 86 was 
uh, definitely an over ask, obviously, right? <laughs> like the, the point was they didn't want to lose any upland acres that they may have by putting just the 35. But I think the real number, I mean, if we said 45, I mean, it's only going to, and with the negotiating committee, uh, like whatever's not upland, we could make that non-transferable to any other place in the PUD or, you know, I don't think that's a big deal. I think the reasoning behind that was just to protect the, not to lose developable upland acreage to a number that was put on an application. Um, I think that was really all I had and in general. And, and to Lewis's point, development impact fees, you know, they pay, pay for schools, police, fire. It's either in the county or it's in the town. Both of them have impact fees, which I think are very similar. Well, the county has impact fees. We don't, we don't, we don't, we, and we don't even collect them anymore. So you're going to have county impact fees. You don't, the town. Okay. It goes to the county, not the town. Okay, I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. It's, we all learn every meeting. We all learn something. Um, but yeah, that, that's basically it. The, the main cohesive plan was the whole reason we're here before you. Any other questions? So, thank you. I have one of Kevin. Kevin. So, what I just heard was the core may determine. There's more wetlands or there's less wetlands. And if the core determined there's less wetlands and the number goes from 35 to 45, as example illustrated, they do not want to lose the right to be able to develop that. So they put a big number out there to cover that. If that is the case, that would still apply at the county level also, would it not? Yes, sir. Okay, so that doesn't change anything. Correct. Okay, and all of that could be negotiated. I guess the other question is, is when will we know what the, the uh, portion of true delineation for wetlands versus um, uplands is? We'd have to know that in order to be able to negotiate it at some point. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure when they're planning on, on doing that por portion of the process, but, um, and, and I was kind of going through listening to you guys from a summary standpoint, some of those issues, and if you were to move this to negotiating committee, would it include that reviewing of the acreage based on wetlands, and then you could potentially have conditions to where none of that acreage, that 86 number, could leave this area. So that way they wouldn't be able to transfer this to somewhere else gives them that flexibility. Let's say that number goes from 35 to 40. They can still have that allotment to develop the area, but then the, the rest, the, the 45 acres that they were proposing, that goes away. Um, they wouldn't be allowed to develop that anywhere else. So Kevin, if, if they figure out, just let's, I like round numbers. Right now they got 35 acres of, of those. If they get an extra 10, so that's 45. Wouldn't the rules change if they were part of the Buckwalter PUD because they could use RDUs from another part of Buckwalter and increase the density on that? They could, they could move residential units that are currently existing in the Buckwalter PUD right. onto this property. That is correct. Um, but those, those units are already allocated for. Um, so from a density standpoint, yes, it could be more dense on that land. The negotiating committee, however, could say no. Yes. So that nothing could transfer in or out. Yep. Uh, other, and if, if you don't mind, if I could, from a summary standpoint, other items you had, um, potential additions to the, the concept plan, if I may. Ooh, I'm sorry. Um, so this is the concept plan. Some of the concerns you talked about innovation drive. Um, as you can see in other areas, what we've done is provided uh, arrows. Oops, sorry, I'm all over the place here. Yes, um, you know potential arrows uh, of locations for access uh, from a transportation standpoint. We could look to um, provide additional information on the concept plan. Again, that would go through uh, negotiating committee. Um, with that, we would review all of those land uses to make sure they're consistent with, with what, what's currently allowed in the county versus what you guys want to make sure is not going to happen, aka prohibited. 
Uh, and then also buffers. Those are items that we would look at with negotiating committee of certain buffers above and beyond in specific areas. I, um, I trust the negotiating committee. I'm on it. <laughs> and, I, and I think I'm a tough sale. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm ready to see it at least get better some more, especially for affordable housing. Any other questions? Questions? And Madam Mayor, I do have a motion here. Uh, if you accept, I do have an additional motion slide after this. Um, no, no, I'm sure to go to the negotiating committee. Yes, I guess I'm just kind of torn while there's such a push to go to the negotiating committee. It's just I've never felt so pushed to go to a negotiating committee before when we're sitting here elected and. Um, it's just hard for me right now to add. I agree with what Larry said. I'll say it again tonight in 20 emails I get. You know, we need to figure out how to fix this mess we're in and to add to the mess and not to have some strong words with the county on how we can do this all together. It's really, really hard. And there's no guarantee of love to Parkway 5B, and I've worked really hard for that because I truly think that's a need, not for a developer, but because of what I had to deal with today on Bluffton Parkway. Um, you don't know what's going on. You don't know when that road's... There's just so many unknowns. I mean, if it, we just pushed it off while we don't even know where Innovation Drive's going to be built. We don't know what the county's going to do with all that redo of their roads with... Parkers, we don't, we just don't know so much, and we don't know what the county thinks. And I really am not out to vote for something when it, I, I don't want them to, I don't want to mess up what we work really hard to do with the county. And I, we have a meeting tomorrow with them. So I mean, I just, I called Eric and he didn't get a call back, but I really hope we had our counterpart on their thoughts on it. Because this is taking a donut hole and making more donut holes and upsetting residents and causing a lot more cars to go on one temporary light. And that's where I just, and I had the same problem two years ago. So, yes. Well, we're not making, I know, but we're deciding, we're deciding what to do. To go to negotiating committee, which is going to draw out things, and I don't know that the applicant realizes how hard that negotiating committee is. I and mean, we start from scratch. Nothing. Don't start with the eighties. I mean, it, they're tough. So I'm fine being tough, but somebody want to make a motion, or you can make a motion. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah, if you want to make a motion. I make a motion to decline to accept acceptance of University Investments LLC and Granny Oaks two LLCs. 100% annexation petitions to annex certain real properties contiguous to the town of Bluffton's corporate boundaries, consisting of a total of 86.36 acres, more or less, and bearing Beaver County tax map numbers R600290000, and R600290000. 2023 budget to provide for certain funds to expenditures of certain funds and to allocate sources of revenue for the said funds. Chris, first reading. Good evening, Mayor and Council. This is our second budget amendment, major budget amendment that we typically have to make any final adjustments 
uh, to get through the final uh, few months of the fiscal year. Uh, briefly, before I go over the budget uh, amendment items, this is in your packets under, under the finance report. This is a status of our revenues through the first six months of our fiscal year. Uh, a couple of things I want to point out. Um, property taxes are up. Obviously, the past couple of years of growth in residential building has uh, resulted in a significant increase in property taxes. We have received our first um, uh, payment from uh, the treasurer, the county treasurer for property taxes, and it is up uh, about 17% over last year. So that is a positive. Um, on the building safety uh, permit uh, line item, as you can see, we are down significantly. Uh, building has declined. We are about a half million less than uh, what was collected last year at this time. And uh, what's a little more concerning is we're even a quarter million less than what we had projected. Uh, luckily, property taxes is making up for most of that. Um, so we are, it's actually cut off here, but it's, uh, we're about 77,000 under budget. I think we are going to be okay given where property taxes are headed. Um, so no cause for uh, immediate alarms, but we're watching it closely. And as you see, we're not gonna have any major, major adjustments to the general fund uh, in the budget limit. This. Uh, real quickly on the special revenue side, I wanted to show you what's happening there. Um, we have discussed before, but uh, accommodation tax revenues are down, um, so there's not as many uh, heads and beds as they say. Uh, but because of the population increase, an increase in, in um, people eating out and, and restaurants, our hospitality tax is up significantly. And I show you this because this applies to a piece of the uh, budget minute. So there's three components. There's a reallocation of ARPA funds, which I'll go into, a uh, adjustments for CIP project cost increases, and a position reclass. So the overall consolidated summary of budget amendment two is 2.1 million. The majority of that is in the CIP fund. And I'll break these down for you. So really quick, the ARPA, so this applies to what we're doing in general fund for this year, uh, year's budget amendment. We had, as you all know, we had a, a, a nonprofit assistance grant program as part of the ARPA program, as well as a small business assistance grant program. We've gone through two rounds of each um, and have awarded um, 17 nonprofit grants in the first round and nine in the second. And in the first round, we awarded 235,000. In the second round, 110,000. <coughs> On the small business side, uh, we helped 11 businesses in the first round and nine in the second round, 172,000 in the first round and 49,000 in the second round, or excuse me, 150,000 in the second round. Where I'm going with this is the balance of what had, we had originally allocated for this program is $225,000. One of the allowable uses for that um, is for neighborhood assistance. One of the positives this year um, is that we have been very aggressive in assisting our neighbors and homeowners in uh, tough situations with uh, repairs on their homes that qual income qualify. And to date, we have spent the uh, entire budget uh, of that amount in the first six months of the year, which is a good problem to have because we are helping people. So the town has assisted 23 homeowners in uh, home repairs, averaging 7,500 and another 18 homeowners with property maintenance uh, issues averaging $756,000. So because this is an allowable use of ARPA dollars, we're recommending that we take 100,000 from that to increase the budget this year for the remaining six or few, few months to carry out some additional applications we received. And then the other portion of that uh, we'll, we'll talk about as part of the budget process for next fiscal year. On the CIP side, what we are seeing in coming in in bids for sewer projects is significantly over uh, what the uh, engineering estimates were a year and a half ago. So it's been a year and a half since those estimates were put together and the bids are coming in significantly higher. So I asked our CIP team to adjust some of the estimates for projects that we hope to bid out by the end of this fiscal year. And they are listed here with the estimated amount to, that will be um, above what was originally budgeted. Now, for a good portion of these, so the ones that are in the historic district, uh, we can use hospitality tax and HDEC, um, excuse me, hospitality tax and accommodations tax to support 
So what we're recommending is using some of our balances there, which are significant, uh, to support those projects. The uh, stormwater utility fund has a balance in there, and we're recommending 259 to go towards the sewer connections, the implementation of the sewer connections uh, program. And for a total of $1.7 million, that will support the increased cost for those projects. And again, those are using our special revenue and sewer funds, not general fund dollars. And then also on the general fund side is a position change. This it was discussed as part of the uh, budget last year, and we recently had a vacancy in the part-time victim's advocate. Our chief is proposing to us, and uh, the town manager agrees to reclass the position to a full-time victim advocate slash social worker. Some of the highlights of this position will develop, coordinate, implement, and evaluate direct services to crime victims, develop and disseminate victim assistance information, conducts follow-up investigations with mental health or substance abuse subjects, and develop partnerships with other local and nonprofit entities. The um, budget impact is 21,000, but for the current year, there is no financial impact because we have enough attrition to cover it, which is why you didn't see that in the previous slides. So you're approving the reclass of the position here. Uh, we don't need additional financial dollars for this. Any questions? Questions? On this side? Questions? Yes, sir. I missed something that I think Stephen told me about as far as the hiring of one employee. Isn't it in this budget? That was the big one. Yeah. Go back to that last slide. That, that's all I was going to answer. Sorry. Yeah. So that's taking the victim's advocate position that was part-time and making it full-time. In doing so, they're also going to take on some social work and provide some assistance to our mental health advocate. Um, if you're referring to the one we talked about with affordable housing, that's something that we're looking at that, that doesn't require anything with the budget amendment. Um, okay. So the victim advocate is part-time? Is currently. The position is currently empty right now. Our victim advocate left uh, between... Thanksgiving and Christmas. So as having the opportunity to fill that position out was a good opportunity to, to look at this and make this transition. So so there's no one in that position, but we're gonna but it it had the a part time placeholder, right? Yes, sir. You wanna make that a full time position. Correct. And add on the additional duties of the social worker to go along with it. Social work to go along with it. Okay. Um, and then one other question talked about in that in that meeting was you wanted to that was a budget meeting about the upcoming budget I think is what yeah. got this a little confusing mm -hmm. yeah, yeah so that's not that's not here tonight it's not here tonight when when you're going to add um uh, six month and six month I minute mean, in J July all the employees that's making under twenty thousand, I mean under twenty thousand dollars. Right, that would be part of the budget that we would do for starting July one. This year we went to, as part of the adoption for the twenty two twenty three budget, we increased it to our minimum pay being eighteen fifty an hour for all full time employees, with the um, proposal that as we get into the twenty three twenty four budget, which will start in July, we would get that up to twenty dollars an hour for starting pay for full time employees. Because that was council's desire during our discussions was to get it up to that level. I would like to see those that's making under twenty dollars an hour get twenty making twenty dollars an hour. I mean under twenty dollars an hour get um, a raise before July. So how can we do that? If that's a desire that council has, that's we can do that through. Um, Personnel action um, and try to find funds through attrition if we can. I don't know if it would require a, a budget amendment at this time. I think so. So, not, okay with attrition. not if we do. And based on the overall cost at looking at what we were preparing for a budget for next year, I think the overall cost was for full time employees was about, it was like $25,000, $30,000. No. To get that up so we can do that in the interim. If that's a desire that council has us as a, as, as, a, as a body. Council, that's a request I have. 
And also, back to the uh, victim advocate, we are down nine police officers. Yes, sir. Um, Chief. <laughs> I would like to see one of those police officers' position be the victim advocate so we can hire eight police officer and a victim advocate. So you're saying instead of moving this to a full-time position, you'd rather take a police officer position that's empty and move it to hire the victim's advocate? Right. Um, so if that's what you would like to do, then it would need to be an amendment to this budget request to remove the reclassification of the full-time position. My yeah, understanding. He needs nine officers. That, again, that's what would need to be an amendment for council. Y'all would have to, that would be something all of them, I would need to. For, for, for um, well, can I answer, let me ask a question that might help with yours. Do you mind before? Yeah. So, we usually don't, I've not seen during this type of year when we move funds that we create a, another position. That's usually in the budget. So I'm confused over this. It's March, basically. We're about to go to budget. We can't even hire nine cops. Or even, and I hate we don't have a victim's advocate because I've had more calls over the lack of money we needed. But when are we going to hire it, this person? We don't seem to hire quickly. Can't this be a budget item and then the money you're using allocate to getting our workers that are actually coming to work? So I'm not certain, and maybe the chief knows, but I believe, you, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's required that we have a victim's advocate or someone does have a victim's advocate, is that? So currently we have a, one of our investigators is doing pretty much dual roles uh, and it's taken away from our investigative ability because now they're referring to victim's advocate, but um, right now he's just fulfilling uh, the base necessities for a victim's advocate, not able to fulfill all the necessities that are required of a victim's advocate, as well as social workers that we want to include in that. Um, and it's, it's taxing on this investigator where he has very little time to actually work cases and focus simply on victims' services. Have we been recruiting? Have we been actively trying? And I know you just um, we, job. We have been actively, actively been trying to get a part timer. No, because we wanted to bring this in front of council to see your desire before we decided to fill the position. <clears throat> if council was willing to move from part time to full time after first reading tonight, we would advertise the position so that if council approved second, we could go ahead and begin hiring that position next month. If council's desire was to keep it part time and not take it to full time and add the additional duties then we would go ahead and look to hire a part-time person and fill that role. Well, I, well it definitely needs to stay <clears throat> full-time. I think in this, in this climate, uh, not too many people are going to be apt to run for a part-time um, position. I think it's going to be more enticing to be able to offer someone full-time uh, wages an hour if we seriously want to get someone in this, um, in this role. But we're so close to our budget, and we don't usually do hires in a mid-year, it comes budget time. That's why I'm, I'm off. Like, but well, when we have a second reading in March, they can't, they're gonna hire April, May, all the summer doing budget. Why Why isn't, I guess I go to Stephen, where, why is this here? Why isn't this during our budget process? It is here because we're doing mid-year budget amendment. And we also have an opportunity with a position that's vacant. And instead of trying to fill that position or have somebody fill that role, as you heard with the chief, having, as we're short staff, having somebody already having to fill in that role. Instead of hiring a part-time person just to be the victim's advocate and then coming back and trying to figure out if we're going to move that person full-time or if we have to find somebody again, our goal was now that we have that position vacant, it's an opportunity to revisit it and make this change now. Because again, if we wait till budget, yes, it may take us two months to fill it, but if we wait until the budget's approved, it's going to be two months after that. So we're trying to get this done March or April versus waiting to July or August. And, and, and the same reason last year, when we did the salary, we came into the class and comp before we adopted the budget because some sometimes opportunities present themselves throughout the year where it's, a, it's an opportune time to take advantage of an opening or something like this where we can make a change. All right, and I think that we're advocating for officer retention and everything else. We shouldn't have officers strained in trying to fill roles that they really aren't um, apt to do, like if the position is for an, an advocate, 
to alleviate that stress, we should, while the opportunity is presented itself, go ahead and, and get this position. So my, my, what I was looking at is how do we spend the $21,000 to $25,000? We got to pick advocates full time, which would be in a budget year, or bring in employees that are working their bottoms off now. We're trying to elevate them. Can they wait? Well, we we can say we're not going to hire eight officers before the budget. We will be able to, we will be able to, we'll be able to cover. We'll be able to cover both. The council has that. Yeah. Plus, what I propose doesn't change the budget. What I'm proposing doesn't change the budget. It just it just removing one one officer and replacing it with advocate. I, I would. I'm not. I would. Uh, uh, but I, let me say this. I, I think one should be there. He's saying remove right. officers. I think the mayor is right. On most of these type of discussions, are typically budget time, whether you're raising increases, whether you're hiring people, et cetera, et cetera. But in the same vein, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, that, vac that there's a vacancy there. There was a salary allocated to it. There's probably salaries allocated to the officers that we haven't hired, I'm assuming. Correct. Correct? So there's been money sitting there that nobody's been able to allocate or spend. So it's not going to hurt us. To Bridges Point at this at this time. If if money was if all the positions were full, that's a whole different argument to me. Mm -hmm. Then you wait the budget time. But nobody's been getting a check since October. You said right? Not even for this position uh, since I think uh, around Thanksgiving. So we have that little bit of money built mm -hmm. up. And, and so that should be enough to almost we, we have a budget. And I'll just say this you saw the number of employees that we introduced tonight. Yeah. Every one of those is a new hire. There was a gap from when that person previously left to when we filled them. That attrition adds up over the year. And that's uh, with what, if, if the council decides they want to move forward with this and with what Councilman Hamilton said, we can make that work within the budget without. Because, because again, this has a budgetary impact, but we're not asking for a budget amendment because there is the law, there is the lapse in salaries and and FICA and all that kind of stuff from this position being empty for a few months. But we also have that throughout the town and other positions. So between these two impacts, we wouldn't need to do a budget amendment to cover both those items. So yeah, so what, what the budget amendment for this, sorry, Chris, is just for the change in the part part time. The full time, anytime we're creating a new full time position, council has to approve that uh, addition of a full time employee uh, uh, position. So Sorry, Chris. I just want to clarify. So, what we're saying as part of the budget amendment, we don't have to adjust the revenue side to, to account for these increased costs. But what you are doing, which you need to recognize, is you're, create, you're increasing that base starting place for next fiscal year. So, if you're approving that, you got to recognize that you're increasing that base starting place for next fiscal year. Um, by twenty one thousand for this position and twenty five thousand if you do the twenty dollar. Uh, that was very uh, outwardly spoken that we were going to do this this year, okay. and I think we all agreed. So we had to figure it out. But I don't want to take away the number of officers that he needs to hire. You got the money. Let's do it. I, I can't do that. Not as tests for growing. Yeah, well, that's not. And I want you to hire them, but that's not. You don't have to discuss it. They said they have the money. I, I, that's I, all you want from sure. us is authorization to hire one more, make the the to go from part time to full time right. in that one position. Okay, and, and as long as well as the other things that Chris run over, which yeah. was yeah. moving the funds to the for the neighborhood assistance program, right. and also the overage for the CIP projects, so we can get, cover the costs that we're seeing increase to get those projects moved. And how do you address Councilman Hamilton's um, desire on the, the gap? I would say Tonight. if that's something that <laughs> none of the council members want to speak out against, we will take that as... Do we have enough to, to move to forward? That? So the hourly increase, yes. Um, I, I would recommend adding it to the motion just for good measure. But And how would you recommend, what verbiage would you add? recommend in that motion. What do you recommend? Um, and, recommend. and Chris, I know this affects budget. Yeah. It does. And I also know we aren't seeing things coming in. We, we can't just be spendthrift. But I think this was super important to council led by both Bridget and Fred for sure, but I think all of us supported it, that we have to figure ways. So there are going to be some things that we got to yeah. whittle. And, and, and to go with that, the discussion that Chris and I, I have already had in preparation for budget moving forward, 
was that this was an implementation, and that's why we have the number of what it was going to cost, because we had planned on that being proposed with the 23-24 budget, so this would just implement it, so as we get into the budget process, it will already be accounted for, and we can Sherry, you're not making a long edition on those. Just for clarification, Senior or Chris, the number that you put on there, the twenty thousand nine hundred, whatever it was, that's just the number to carry us through to the beginning of the new budget year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we'll have. But we haven't even hired them yet. Nope. So yeah. they don't get them for another couple of months. Those numbers are. That's nowhere close either, right? We, we have to assume that as of it's second reading, you have somebody. Acres, you know what? What are we talking about? Yeah. 86 yeah. acres? Or, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> if we don't hire the next, if we don't hire by May, all this, there's attrition, there's still money built up. Right. But, yeah. but, our, but our goal, like I said, is if council approves tonight, we will go ahead and advertise the position so that at second reading, we can go ahead and begin filling the position. Right. 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 And if it should council not approve on second reading, yeah. we can stop the process. Any other questions on this? Okay, that horse is done. So, is there a motion to approve the first reading of an ordinance amending the town of Bluffton fiscal year 2023 budget to provide for expenditures of certain funds and to allocate sources of revenue for the said funds, and um, any as well as any full-time employees making less than twenty dollars an hour um, receive a raise effective March first, 2023, to twenty dollars an hour? So, second. Any discussion? Yes, sir. Just speak with Chris. That may need to go to March 15th because if you're going to, have to do second reading on the combined motion, um, so make it make it please revise the motion to March 15th because we'll have our our second reading on this motion. We'll we'll have occurred before March 15th. So we have a first and a second. Yes. And we're in discussion. So we need to get modified by whoever made the motion. Larry. Huh? Is there? <laughs> What do you say? You need to modify the motion oh. to be effective March 15th. Just Thank say you. I modify my motion. I modify motion. my motion to be effective March 15th. Good job. So now we vote on that, right? So all in any discussion. All in favor on the modification. Step saying aye. 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 Those opposed. That's unanimous. And that's it. No, now go to the motion. Oh, uh, now we're back to motion. one day. I'll know this. Now we're back to the motion. This, um, any other discussion? All in favor say, of saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. I get lost. I get lost on that. I hate when we have to amend. I, we do it every time. So I never remember it. Is it a point of interest? Is it, point of interest? Is it typically the motion? The, the amended is after the original? Do you, you not vote typically on the the original motion first and the amendment? No, you would you would you would vote to amend the motion. Okay. I know that. I just okay. don't like it. Um, item number five under formal items approval, and this can all be very quick. It's more for transparency. Um, to approve a, a con construction contract to JS Construction Services for Buck Island Simmonsville Phase 6B sidewalks project. That's a fiscal impact of $354,397. We like to bring this out because it People who are watching and in the audience should see where we're spending your money. Yes, so ma'am. And be ever so brief and yes, ma'am. I understand I'm standing between everyone and their loved ones this evening. This is to complete the sixth and final phase of sidewalk construction connecting from May River Road all the way up to Bluffton Parkway. This particular project was bid in October of last year with no responses. Staff has worked over the last couple of months to individually solicit bids through our procurement process. And we have found that JS Construction Services base bid is within the engineer's ex estimated cost. And as these are getting cut off, and the, within the available budget amount for this year. So our recommendation is that you authorize the town manager to execute said contract with JS Construction Incorporated, including a 20% contingency for any allocations that might arise during the construction. And if you so move that, we will go ahead and move forward with executing the contract with JS and moving forward with the procurement of materials and the project schedule, which he says he does not anticipate any issues with supply chain on this one. Any questions? If you can put that motion back up. Yes, sir. I noticed you asked for 20%, we used to ask for 10%. What's changed? 
everything, the price estimates. That's why we just did the budget amendment. And that's not to be flippant. It really is. Everything is fluctuating daily. Uh, still, it's, 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 we don't want to put budget over again. I, I will add on to that as we found out with the drainage project on Buck Island is until we start digging up, we don't know what's there. We, as we uncovered that unknown water line that wasn't marked, that didn't have the stuff for me. So until we did, we're finding that- We're finding we're, old infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? Um, okay, is, is there a motion to authorize the county manager to enter into an agreement with JS Construction Services for construction of Buck Island Sentinelville Phase 6B sidewalk project? This agreement includes a commitment from the town of Bluffton for $354,397 and a 20% contingency to be paid from the appropriate town funds. So, Is there a second? One of y'all second? Second. Okay, any discussion? Um, people were at the curve at the Buck Island drainage today when I finally had to wiggle my way around to find They're it. prepping. They're prepping for, and that's a outside of this it's outside of this discussion and yes I, and I, just, I don't need it but the water was receding so whatever they're doing they were doing yeah they were dewatering preparing for the road closure and a completion of that drainage connection you can say that's just was just evening just letting everyone know it's nice to see any other discussion? discussion all in favor say by saying aye aye, aye. opposed that's unanimous um kim uh authorized $71,600 to contract 2021-30 with Thomas and Hutton. Oh, no, then you skip one? Oh, I, I skip. checked it off. <laughs> <laughs> just get on to the end. I can go through it quickly. <laughs> no, it's considered, well, you're just saying here. Consideration of the ordinance ratifying a non-exclusive easement over certain real property owned by the town of Bluffton consisting of the parcel listed in favor of Dominion Energy of South Carolina for the new Riverside Barn Park. This is first reading, so we'll... You'll see me next see next month. Next month on this as well. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Tracy, my arrow is not working. Thank you. Um, as we all know, we had the, the ribbon cutting on the New Riverside Barn property. We've initiated phase one site construction. We do require to have electricity run to the property. We've been working with Dominion Energy to identify a potential easement area to connect and run energy to the property to serve the playground, the restrooms, and other ancillary facilities that will be out there as well as the barn. Thank you. And then it worked. I don't know. It locked up. Uh, this particular exhibit was submitted to us from Dominion showing how there would be a 15-foot easement coming from Okatee Highway to the general area where the new playground will be constructed and then it will there will be conduit and it will be split off to run to other areas as needed. Uh, underground? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, I wanted to have this up here for full disclosure of what was included in the easement. It's allowing Dominion the right to go ahead and put in their lines, replace their lines, maintain their lines, as well as the easements on the spaces on either side of any of their structures, which would extend for potentially 15 feet from poles. Not potentially, it would be 15 feet from poles. Um, you can, if you want me to go through that, I can. Uh, and other, our side of it says that we are not going to put any structure there and that we will maintain the grass at a height between 36 inches and maximum coverage of 54 inches and we will allow them right of entry to do the work that they need to do for maintenance. I don't want to go through that too quickly. Is that all right? So our recommendation is for you to go ahead and approve on first reading this ordinance since this is a conveyance of land and an easement to Dominion at 30 Red Barn Drive. After, if there is positive favor for this this evening, you'll see me next month with no changes and it'll be recorded and we'll move forward. You'll see me come back again with a service agreement for construction costs in a month or so, two months probably, and Dominion Energy will then go ahead and run their lines as we come through with the conduit and install that as part of phase one site construction. Any questions? Thank you. Um, is there a motion to approve the um, first reading of Ordinance 2023 dash? Wait a minute, yours is wrong. 20? We don't have a number yet. Oh, okay. Uh, because if we so second you read. just don't you just omit that just first reading of, of an uh, ordinance, ordinance to execute 
to execute, thank you, Kim, to execute and ratify all prior actions related to the easement agreement involving town property <coughs> located at 30 Red Barn Drive based on documents and exhibits provided by Dominion Energy of South Carolina, Inc. So moved. There's second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Seven, approval to authorize a $71,600 amendment to contract 2021-30 with Thomas and Hutton Engineering to complete engineering design and permitting for the Boundary Street scape, Streetscape Fiscal Impact 138,800. Yes, yes, ma'am. So uh, when this came out of the 2021 strategic plan and was in the 21 consolidated budget, there were limited funds available to go ahead and create the um, request for qualifications that was awarded in February 4th of 2021. So what was completed was the initial scope of work and design. What we're looking for because of the budget limitations at that time is to get this across the finish line, which kicked it across a $100,000 threshold to bring it back to you. So currently under the initial contract, which was $67,600, Thomas and Hutton has completed and met their milestones. And at this point in time, we're looking for that additional funding to complete permitting with DHEC as well as getting out through bidding, the delivery of the construction contracts, and easement acquisition. So what we're requesting is this amendment. This is more information and background on what would be included. We're meeting the stormwater's design for this public project, as well as working with DOT and the town of Lufkin for stormwater permits, our dry utility coordination. This, of course, is being done in coordination with our sewer projects as well. So again, the reason I'm here is because the original budget was 71,600 with the funds that were available, um, or I'm sorry, the original budget was what was authorized with the additional budget of 71,600. This is kicking us up to 138,000. So we wanted to be transparent that the contracts exceeded that limit. If you're good with it, we'll go ahead and amend. We'll go ahead and continue with the coordination of permitting, and it will be anticipated to complete the permitting cycle in 23 and easement acquisition in 24. <laughs> if that goes well with our consultants and everybody cooperating, we hope that we could initiate construction late 24, but the bulk of the Boundary Street Street State construction will be allocated in fiscal year 25. Any questions? Great, thank you. Is there a motion to authorize the town manager to approve a change order to the contract 2021-31? So the agenda is 30. What is it? 31. Okay. Um, with Thomas and Hutton Engineering Company in the amount of $71,600 to complete civil engineering services for the Boundary Street State project. So moved. There's second. Second. Any discussion? Are we messed up with the agenda says 202130 and the motions 202131? Yes, I think that uh, the, if, if the motion is correct, then the agenda, we all know what we're talking about. Okay. 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 Any other discussion? All in favor, state by saying aye. Aye. <coughs> Opposed? That's unanimous. We have a consent agenda, which is just as important as the last two hours we've spent here because it has great reports. Um, is there anything council would like to be discussed separately before we vote on the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as listed on the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, step of saying aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. We have one small item in executive session um, that we'll have action from, if the press wants to say. So is there a motion to go into executive session for personnel matters regarding town council, um, town council appointments of board committees and commissions, and that is FOIA at 3470A1. Second. 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 Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? We are going to go to executive session and we'll come back out.
from executive session. Is there a motion to appoint William Rickett to the Watson Township Fire Board um, as our representative? So, Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor say by saying aye. 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 Um, is there a motion to appoint Doug McGill to the Affordable Housing Committee? I made that motion. I'll say. Any discussion? All in favor say by saying aye. Aye. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't get you some more for the Is there a motion to adjourn? Yes. Yeah. <laughs>